Speaking of New England and New Hampshire, on Thursday, on Thursday it was my mom's 89th birthday. And uh, she was born in Dublin, Dublin, New Hampshire. Her family's from Dublin. And back then, uh, you were born in the house you were raised in. She was born there in her house in Dublin. And it's good to be here in New Hampshire. Been here maybe 20, 25 times in the last few weeks. And it's great to have the first in the primary status here. You take that responsibility very, very seriously. And as you do, I hope, I know you will, look at three things as you decide who you're going to support for president. First of all, the record of the person running. Second, the character of the person running. And then thirdly, what is the vision for the future of the person running for president? For me, I'm the only one running, Republican or Democrat, that has been a mayor, a governor, and a United States senator. That's good background to run for president of the United States. As mayor, obviously I plowed the snow, educated the children, and kept property taxes down, or I wouldn't have been reelected three times. I served four terms as mayor, as well as two terms as a councilman. That's a hard job. You can't miss a snowstorm. Then I went to the United States Senate, and I was in the middle of many, many controversial Bush-Cheney initiatives in my time in the Senate. First, it was the tax cuts, which I voted against. They favored the wealthy. The wealthy were doing just fine. Then it was the war in Iraq. As Senator Sanders articulately pointed out, you do not enter into war lightly, and I voted against that. Right. Then it was all the environmental issues, regulating carbon dioxide, not drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, vote after vote on ANWR. Standing up for civil liberties time and time again, live free or die. Standing up for abortion rights, and that's one of the reasons I voted against Samuel Alito to the Supreme Court. I just did not think he'd I did not think he'd keep the exception for the health of the mother, and I was right. I was one of the gang of 14, seven Republicans, seven Democrats that got together to try and bridge the partisan divide. I was proud to be part of that group getting together, meeting, and trying to bridge the gridlock that we suffer from today even. Of course, LB, LGBT rights time and time again, a steady 100% record on that. Very proud of that. And way back in 2005, there was a bill to, for a pathway to citizenship for our 11 million undocumented Americans. And there were only nine co-sponsors. It was 10 years ago in 2005. There were only nine of us that stepped up, and I was one of the nine uh, in favor of a path to citizenship. We should have passed it back then. So there are many tough votes under political pressure, and I'm proud that I always made the right choice. And then it was on to being governor, and those were tough times. I got elected in 2010. The economy was terrible. Rhode Islanders were out, with, were out of work on the highest un unemployment percentages in the country, foreclosures on their houses. It was tough, tough times. But we turned the state around. We turned Rhode Island around, and we had the biggest drop of unemployment of all but Nevada in my four years' budgets. At the same time, turning the state around economically, we did good things. We had the best rollout of the Affordable Care Act. That, was, that wasn't easy. That wasn't easy. Getting people to sign up for the exchange, all the problems that happened across the country, they didn't happen in Rhode Island. We passed marriage equality. That wasn't easy. They tried before, time and time again in Rhode Island. I put it in my inaugural address, and we made it happen. The DREAM Act so that undocumented students could go to our in-state colleges for in-state tuition. And we raised the minimum wage three times in my four years as governor.
That's a solid record. That's a very solid record. And through all that, I've been honest, honest with the people on everything I do. I've had the courage, I hope I've shared that with you, to take tough votes, showed some guts under pressure, and always had high ethical standards. In almost 30 years of public service, I haven't had any scandals. <laughs> now, as we look to the future, I believe in prosperity through peace. On the prosperity side, there is a disparity of wealth. There's no doubt about it. It is real. And how do we close this gap between the haves and the have-nots? I propose, of course, as I shared with you, I've always voted for raising the minimum wage as a senator and as governor. We did three times in my four years. But I think we should do more than that. And right now, there are seven marginal rates in our tax structure. And the top rate is for 464,000, those making over 464,000. And that is 39.6%. That's not that high, 464,000, when you think of all the millionaires and billionaires out there. And get this, listen to this, only 0.6% of the tax filers are in this bracket. Less than 1% of everybody that files is in this top bracket. But this 0.6% generate 30% of the revenue that comes in on income tax. So my point is, the wealthy are doing just fine. The rest of America is struggling, and yet there's a lot of money still to be had out there, I believe. to put to good use, obviously. So I propose a new bracket. This would be the eighth bracket for over 750,000, those making over 750,000, and put it at 45%. This is going to generate a lot of revenue. And how do we help those that need it most? I would propose raising the personal exemption. That's now at $4,000. This would best benefit the lower income taxpayers, I believe. So let's put that top bracket on, tax the wealthy, they can afford it, and put it to the best use possible, increasing the personal exemption above $4,000. As I've shared with you, I've always supported raising the minimum wage, but I think this is a better way to accomplish how we address income inequality. Also, as we look to the future, I served on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and I chaired the Western Hemisphere Subcommittee, so I've traveled all through Central America, South America, and then I chaired the Middle East Subcommittee. So I've traveled to Pakistan, Afghanistan, Israel, Lebanon, Egypt, Iraq, I've been all through the region in the Middle East. And as we all know, this is one of the biggest challenges facing America right now. And I submit to you, doesn't it make sense that someone that saw through all the lies of going into Iraq should be someone that you would trust to help solve this chaos that spread from Pakistan to Nigeria? Doesn't that make sense? The whole reason we have this chaos is because we made that colossal mistake of invading Iraq. And now the hard work is in front of us of how we fix it. In Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Yemen, in Syria, in Libya, in Nigeria. And I'm running for president because I saw through all the prevarications. I took the time to go down to the CIA and said, I have to vote on this Iraq war. Show me everything you have on weapons of mass destruction. And over an hour long meeting, there wasn't much. There wasn't much. There was no reason to vote for that war. I did my homework. And I do believe, I'm sure there are people out there saying, Governor Chafee, we cannot get peace in the Middle East. It's never going to happen. I disagree. First of all, you have to believe it's possible, and then you want to have to make it, want to make it happen. 
And I have both of those. I believe it's possible, and I want to get peace in the Middle East and across North Africa. I believe it's possible. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me here as you look at who you're going to support, your record, your character, your vision, and let's have a great year in 2016, Democrats. I know we are, because we're right on the issues. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. You're terrific, New Hampshire. Doing good work. Thank you.